Good evening, everybody. We're going to begin session four of our series on how to prepare and teach a Bible study. And tonight we're going to deal with a, a class called the seven laws of teaching. There is no original thought to my lesson here, very little. Uh, most of it is based on this book here called Teaching to Change Lives. And uh, by Howard Hendricks, and it's uh, you can tell it's kind of a 1980s cover. That's when I I, I bought it and read it uh, first, and uh, and uh, and that is his take on a book that was written in uh, 1884. So a hundred years before he wrote that book, there, um, it, 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 there's this book written by John Milton Gregory called uh, "The Seven Laws of Teaching," and um, and so the Seven Laws of Teaching later. Uh, the, the, the person who wrote this book was a minister. Uh, he was the uh, president of the University of Illinois and uh, was uh, quite a famous educator. And so it was written from a Christian perspective, but I, I really like what Howard Hendricks did with it. And, uh, and it, it, it's just some uh, principles about education. So it's kind of a different lesson in the sense that, you know, it's not I mean, there's there's Bible truths that that uh, that illustrate it, but it's um, it's it's kind of basic thoughts uh, that helps us to think through our role as a teacher. And so uh, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to just thank you for uh, the time that we could study tonight on how to be a teacher. We pray that uh, you will uh, bless our our time together. I pray for those who are uh, struggling in pain, that you would uh, give them a healing. And uh, we think of the crisis in uh, Ukraine, and we just pray for, uh, we, we pray for your will to be done uh, there uh, soon uh, for those who are, for the, for this just to stop and, uh, and people to uh, turn to, to the Lord Jesus Christ amidst such a human evil. Father, thank you again just for this time. Uh, in our Savior's name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to talk about tonight the uh, seven laws of teaching. As I mentioned, uh, I, I mentioned the books that it's based on, uh, Howard Hendricks and John Milton Gregory. I've also put the links in the notes if you're interested in, in uh, doing that. There's also another book that's kind of based on it by Bruce Wilkinson from uh, Walk Through the Bible called Seven Laws of the Learner. And I've also given you uh, his laws and summary uh, in our notes as well. But these are some great tools just to help us to think through the role of the teacher. Um, when we put Hendricks and Gregory side by side, uh, we have the, the laws of the teacher, education, activity, communication, heart, encouragement, and readiness. If you will note that this, uh, it's actually an acrostic for teacher, which is really cool. Um, if, you, if you take a look at Wilkinson's Law of the Learner, uh, it's the acrostic spells learner, which is also really neat. And so, you know, they had a hundred years to think of it after Gregory. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same laws of Gregory, just, uh, just done, and I think in a, in a really wonderful way. I've also posted in the notes a link where Howard Hendricks himself teaches on the first law, and uh, and uh, it's forty five minutes of 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 brilliance. He's just one of my favorite communicators, and so if you want to get a, a great expansion on the law of the teacher, uh, he does a, a fine job on the YouTube link that I posted in the notes. All right, well we're going to begin with the law of the teacher. And, uh, and the law goes this way. If you stop growing today, you stop teaching tomorrow. Gregory worded it this way. Know thoroughly and familiarly the lesson you wish to teach. Teach from a full mind and a clear understanding. But the basics here is the preparation of the teacher. We as teachers always have to be growing and learning. Hendricks says, this law embraces the philosophy that I, as a teacher, 
I'm the primary learner, not our students. We're the primary learner. We are the student among students. I am perpetuating the learning process. I am still en route. And so it's really important that we become uh, the ultimate students. I know that there's a lot of times, you know, when we give people the responsibility to, to preach a sermon or to teach a lesson or to do the lesson in day camp, <clears throat> they'll always say, boy, I got more out of that than any of the students did. And that's always true if we put the work into it. Because we need to be the one who will learn and cover what, what the students need to know. And we have to do it in a fuller way than we would probably even communicate. That's why a lot of times we might spend 20 to 25, sometimes 30 hours on a one hour lesson, right? You're, you're, you're gaining in a whole bunch of things and, and filtering it into a, a, a lesson. And so, uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's the important law of this teacher is that we as teachers, we need to keep growing. <clears throat> After all, we're encouraged in scripture to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're to be growing. We're not to be, uh, you know, there's this sense where we can just check out, you know, I'm uh, on the verge of retirement and I don't need to do this anymore, you, you know, and we stop growing. We're to, uh, we're to continue to grow. We're to grow in grace. We're to grow in knowledge. We're to grow in both of them because there are some times that people are very gracious, but they don't know anything. And that doesn't really help a student. Or they, they have a lot of knowledge, but they're not gracious. Maybe you've had teachers like that. They know a lot, but they just, they weren't nice. Uh, we're we're to, to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's some who just like to confront. There's some who just like to bully. And um, we, we need to be growing in grace and knowledge. But the key is that we're growing. Jesus himself increased in wisdom and stature. He grew, he increased in favor with God and man. And so even Jesus in his humanity was not stagnant. And check out this verse here in Luke 6, 40, the last part of verse 40. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. I mean, think about that. What kind of responsibility that puts on us that, uh, we're generating disciples in our teaching. When everyone is fully trained, we'll be like his teacher. So that's, uh, that, that's a big wake-up call, that as James 3.1 would sober us up into the deep responsibility of being a teacher. And so as we, we think about this, we, we need to know what it is that we are teaching. And some of the things that... Uh, um, that he suggests, Howard Hendricks, is that we spend time not just reading, but we spend time reflecting on the lesson. He says for every 30 minutes you read on a subject we sh that we're going to teach on, we should be spending 30 minutes reflecting on it. Because otherwise it's just head knowledge instead of seeing how we digest it and how it applies he said that um, we are going to be most influenced by two things when it comes to our teaching. Number one, the people we meet. And number two, the books that you read. Uh, readers are leaders, you've, you've heard that said before. But um, the I, Howard Hendricks said, you're reading too much if you reflect too little. And so uh, if, if we're reflecting too little and we're just reading, then it's, uh, it's, it's just knowledge without, without grace, without growth, without wisdom. So he says, read, be around people who will inspire you and challenge you in this area. It's great. This Thursday, I'm going to be with some of the local pastors in the area, some of the neighborhood pastors. And, you know, we're just going to talk ministry and encourage each other. But this would be a time of inspiring each other uh, in terms of just the difficulty of ministry and encouraging each other. And that's a, 
that's, that's a neat thing to do. Secondly, he says, take continuing education courses. And I'm glad you guys are here tonight. I, there are uh, some of you who could teach this class far better than I could. I mean, it, um, you know, we, uh, Dr. Young is the, is, it has been our, our, our church's preeminent Bible study teacher. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's been no one like Doc. Uh, you know, we, we, we can eat out of his, his hands or, or Jenny and Margaret and, uh, and uh, you know, are just fantastic teachers who I would learn so much from uh, if they were to teach this class. But, you know, the, the thing is, uh, they're here because we can all challenge each other to keep on growing. Also, <clears throat> we need to be in a personal study program in the Word. Um, many of us are under the Word of God, but we're not in the Word of God. And so that's, those are some of the things to focus on when we, number one, know what we are teaching. Secondly, we need to know who we are teaching. Know the subject, but also know our students. Know our students on a personal basis. Howard Hendricks said, classes don't die, but people die in the class. And that's what we need to prevent. We must, uh, we must earn the right to teach the student. We can't assume that they're interested. We have to create this, um, we have to create this interest. And so it's, it's a job to know our students. I, uh, I learned a lot from how my wife who has 34 piano students and she does, she does not teach them all in the same way, right? I mean, we have, uh, you know, I mean, there's the, the brilliant Audrey and Oliver, you, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that are, are amazing one way, but then she also has some really young students who can sometimes just be discouraged. She has another student who's not, uh, um, who, who's just learning the English language and gets picked on at school. And she just sits and a lot of times just listens to him and connects to his heart, you know, and every student is different. Uh, there was one young student who, when he started, was just kind of a little rascal, not all that interested and didn't really pay attention. And, and now uh, is super motivated in, in learning. And so it's, it's been neat to see how she has understood her students and has adapted. Um, she does not teach one student the same. You know, I mean, she just she's flexible. And that's what we need to do. We, we need to we need to understand our student. Howard Hendricks shared a story of a of a uh, a junior high class that was so rowdy it ate up seven teachers. And there was this one guy who came in and he took the class and he transformed that class. And so Howard Hendricks was asking, "What did what did you do, you know, to transform this class?" and and turn it around when seven other teachers just could not survive that class. And he said, I took a notebook and I put pictures of each of my students there. And I wrote notes about each of them. Like one struggles in math. Another one goes to Sunday school, but doesn't want to be there. It's only there because the parents drag them. You know, um, another one is super motivated and wants to be a missionary one day. And so he said what he does is he takes this notebook and he prays over each of his students regularly. And because he knows his students, he knows how to connect to them. And so that, that's one of the uh, things that we need to understand is not only that part of the law of the teacher is not only to know your material and that we're growing in our material, but we know the class and we, we adjust to, to who our students are. And then the third aspect is to know how we are teaching, to know how we are teaching. We are not just to communicate material, but we are to, we're not just to focus on just 
how to get the material out. But teaching is what a teacher does, whether or not the student. Uh, some teachers think that teaching is just communicating the material, uh, even if the student doesn't learn. There's teachers in school like that. They don't care. They're just going to, you know, there's professors at the university. They're going to communicate the material. If you get it, great. If you don't get it, that's too bad for you. All right. But to know how we are teaching, is to realize that if the learner doesn't learn, we're not teaching the way we ought to be teaching. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's our responsibility to help the student learn. Now, what's interesting is when you take a look at Deuteronomy 4.1, and it talks about the statutes, right? And he goes, I am teaching you that you, and do them that you may live. Then the start of the next chapter, Deuteronomy 5.1, talks about the statutes and rules you're hearing today you shall learn them and be careful to do them you know and so you're thinking okay well there's teaching and learning you know what's the difference between teaching and learning actually in the hebrew it's the same word teaching and learning are the uh, it's the same concept and so if we're not teaching right they're not learning right if they're not learning right we're not teaching right so that's why we need to focus on how we are teaching. It is our responsibility to relate content and communication, facts and the form of teaching, to uh, between what we teach and how we teach it, between the message and the method. We're, we're relating the message and the method. So we know what the message is. It's the word of God. But how am I going to communicate it in a way that, okay, we have the authority of the word of God. Am I communicating it as this is what God is saying to us? The nature of the message determines the nature of the method. And we are not to bore people with the word of God because the word of God is not boring. And if we make it boring, then that's our problem. It's not the word of God's problem. But that's the idea is to, to know uh, the material, know our students, and then know how to bring the material to the students. That's the law of the teacher. And so as we reflect, you know, um, he has some questions here in terms of uh, what areas of growth in your life in the past year do you think are the most obvious to those you teach? Right? How, do, how do your students see you grow? Um, how have you grown in your understanding of the word and your attitude towards teaching? Um, how can you change your weaknesses into strengths? So those are just some thoughts in terms of thinking about the law of the teacher. Are we growing in the material? Do we know our students? And do we know how to translate that material into a way that the students will understand it. This brings us to the second law. The second law of, of uh, teaching is the law of education. Simply put by Hendricks, the way you learn determines how you teach. Or as Gregory puts it, gain and keep the attention and interest of the pupils upon the lesson. Do not try to teach without attention. So the idea here of education is we need to grasp their attention. We've, you know, we, it's it's just funny. We, uh, you know, as as we're looking at uh, we starting our junior church, we starting our day camp again. Uh, you know, PK and I were just kind of sharing some stories the other day, you know, of 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago of, uh, of that. There's, there's, there's a young lady who had been in our day camp probably two decades ago, who's looking at bringing her own kid to day camp. And we go, oh man, you know, and it's just, uh, it's, it's just, it's just kind of amazing. We remember, um, you know, who we've had to hold down and wrestle down just to keep them from running out of their classroom yeah. you know and it's just it's just it's just really interesting as we we think about all of these things but 
when we think of our students, how do we grasp their attention? So the, the first thing that we need to understand in the law of education is that when it comes to teaching, we're not just teaching them facts, but we're teaching them how to think, not just what to think, but how to think. We learn better by doing than by hearing. And if we teach them how to think, it's greater than teaching what to think. It's kind of like, you know, that old phrase, um, teaching a person to fish is better than giving them a fish. You know, you can give them a fish and they'll, they'll, they'll have a meal, but uh, you teach them how to fish, they'll never go hungry. And that's kind of the same idea. We want the student to not just hear what we have to say, but to learn um, and, uh, and not just through hearing them sitting down and just listening to a lecture. Um, so we learn better by doing than by hearing. You know, you've probably, um, the, so there's, there's ways to do this. Uh, if you were to do the assignment that we, uh, we assigned at the beginning of class, you would get more out of the class because then you would be actually putting this into practice. You know, you can hear what I'm saying and you'll get about 10% of it, right? Uh, visually, you could see what we're doing. You get 50% of it, uh, according to what psychologists say. But if you're actually doing this in the process, you'll retain 90% of it, right? And, and you've probably heard those statistics before. But th that's the idea is that we, we need to teach how to do this. The student will learn more through self-discovery than through a lecture. Uh, John Milton Gregory uh, says, focusing on stimulating and directing the learner's self-activities, such as, you know, in your science classes, you had labs, right? You dissected a frog. You know, it was gross, but you learned so much about anatomy by dissecting a frog or, uh, or doing experiments and chemistry and flame tests and chlorine, right? I mean, just, just doing these things helps you learn it better than just seeing the formulas in a textbook or going on a field trip or writing an essay, right? Where you have to digest the information about the book you're reading or the topic you're writing. And so part of what we do as teachers is to create tension. Through tension, there is development. Now, we have to have the right balance because if there's too much tension, there's stress, there's uh, frustration. We must find that equilibrium, but we want to give some tension. One of the illustrations comes from the scripture of Mark 4, the parable of the, uh, the soil, right? The sower of the seed is the same. The seed is the same, right? The gospel, and, but the soils are different. Uh, the hard soil, the receptive soil, the soil with weeds that choke and the, oh, the, the one that's shallow and blows away, right? So, so it's, um, so knowing the different responses of the soil you know, we need, to, we need to know how our students, in a sense, are different. We're teaching the same lesson, but it's going to be received differently. We need to understand that. Not only are we teaching students how to think, but we're also teaching students how to learn, how to learn. So we want to teach them how to think, but also how to learn. Create learners, Hendrick says, who will perpetuate the learning process for the rest of their lives. And so this is where we want to teach them how to read, right? And, and not, just, not just to read to get through it, but read to observe things in the text that repeat, that contrast, that are stressed uh, by God, that, that teach about Christ, uh, and to observe, interpret. We talked about context. We want to teach them how to research, how to draw personal application, how to depend on the spirit of God, how to pray when they're studying the scriptures, how to reflect personally, how to ask questions 
and answer questions in the scriptures uh, and how to use Bible helps that are either physical books or even online resources, right? We're, what we're doing is we're teaching students not just how to think, but how to learn. And so, uh, you know, as we reflect, what kind of teachers do you enjoy learning from and why? You know, like who or what was your favorite teacher? Let's let's pause and let's answer that question. Um, you know, thinking back even from childhood, maybe your old Sunday school teacher, maybe somebody you teach with, you know, uh, who do you enjoy learning from and why? I can share. Sure. Uh, uh, there are several history teachers or a couple history teachers that I really enjoyed learning from, I think, because their passion for the subject and just being able to tell meaningful stories. Yes, yes. And it's so critical with history teachers, because if you have one who's just so disconnected, uh, it can be really, really boring and painful. And then you get a history teacher that's really, really passionate. Boy, it just opens up the world to you. Thanks for sharing, Kayla. Someone else have a, have a teacher or that maybe it's someone you teach with or have been taught by? I can also share. Yeah, hi, um, Brian. So in high school, I had a uh, music teacher, uh, my band director, um, uh -huh. and she would teach me clarinet. And after a while, she saw that I was learning a little bit faster than what she was giving me. And so uh, instead of keeping to the regular uh, curriculum like every other student, she challenged me by giving me a little bit more until I got frustrated, but then she knew that I could do it. So she kept on pestering me in a good way to challenge me to grow more. So that nice. much I very much enjoyed. That's great, right? So she knows your students. She's got a whole class full, but she knew exactly what you needed and the type of motivation that you needed personally. That was different than other students. That's great. Someone else? Yeah, I, uh, I think I enjoy teachers that get their student engaged uh, and get them to think and participate uh, rather than teachers that just lectures and buy the books and, and buy the script and not go off the script. Some teachers actually go off the script and ask mm. questions and get their student engaged. I think I learned a lot more from those teachers. Oh, that's great. Yeah, thank you, Clayton. Yeah, I, yeah. I, Steve, okay. I, you know, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but, but I appreciate your teaching, Mr. Steve, and, uh, and your method of teaching, especially in these classes where you just really take the time to write this down for us so that we can reflect on it. While you're teaching, we have your notes as well as have your PowerPoint, and uh, we know that you have the heart in it. And another teacher that I've always been really, really appreciate is Dr. Stan Young. Um, you know, he's taught us for 20 years consistently through Bible studies and his method is uh, really, I mean, he checks all the boxes here that is indicated of an of a excellent teacher. And, uh, well, amen. Any depth we have at Fellowship Bible Church is largely due to Dr. Young. And so yeah, we're just so great, grateful. We, we've been yeah, very blessed. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for those thoughts. All right. So we got two laws down, law, laws of uh, the teacher, laws of education. The third law is the law of activity. Um, I don't think I'm always going to read Vincent on this. I'll just read Hendrix's little uh, um, a summary here. But he says, maximum learning is always the result of maximum involvement. And so this is a, a way to to uh, get, uh, get the student involved. Howard Hendricks says uh, that our task as a communicator is not to impress people, but to impact them. We're not just to convince them, but we're to change them. You know, Romans 8, 29 says of us who are predestined, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You know, and when you think of where we were when we were saved and how far we have to be like the sun, there's a lot of change that needs to happen. And um, 
and that's part of what we're trying to help uh, our students uh, achieve is that change to become more conformed to the image of Christ. And so what we need to do is uh, to understand you know, change is progressive. You start somewhere and then you move forward, right? And in mathematics, you started with addition and then we started, well, we started by learning the numbers <laughs> and then we started to learn the value of numbers and then we started addition and then subtraction and multiplication and division. And I, I think that's as far as I went, but you know, it, you built on something and it's, uh, uh, and, and that's what we want to do is we want to help the students take those steps towards progress. But we do that by getting them involved. Maximum involvement leads to maximum learning, says Hendricks. So there's, uh, there's some thoughts that we a lot of times use as uh, teachers or as coaches or whatever. One thing about these seven rules is that they really apply to everything. They apply uh, to every age group, every culture, and every topic. Um, and, and so, so it, it's, um, I thought it was pretty well thought out. But um, here are some purposeful activities. Uh, purposeful activity implies quality activity. Now, there are some people who say practice makes perfect. Um, that's not a bad phrase. Better than that, though, is that practice makes permanent because you could practice the wrong thing. I don't know if you ever saw, uh, a, there's a basketball player by the name of Charles Barkley. He's a great basketball player, but he's got the ugliest golf swing. And uh, you know, you can, you can practice the wrong stuff and then practice will not make perfect. It will make permanent. And it, sometimes it can be permanently ugly because we practice the wrong thing. What's, what's, uh, what's more true is that well-guided practice makes per per makes perfect. So we want to guide the practice of our student, and that will bring to perfection. So not just practicing anything, but guiding their practice. That's discipleship, isn't it? Secondly, some people will go, experience is the best teacher. Yes, experience is a teacher, but there are bad experiences that are teachers too. And bad experiences are not good teachers. You know, it's, it's like the person who says, oh, well, you know, I just want to try drugs so I can learn about it. Uh, no, <laughs> you know, I mean, illegal uh, drugs uh, and, and not the prescribed ones from your doctor. So it's, uh, you know, a bad, just, you know, or I'm going to go through, you know, I want to experience immor immorality, you know, just so I can learn about life. Um, bad experience is not a good teacher. Here's the better phrase. Properly evaluated experience is the best teacher, right? We need to evaluate it according to the word of God properly. And, and so understanding that, that's a good teacher. But experience is a, a profound teacher. We just want to have the right experience to give them. And so when it comes to our, our classes, to our kids, our Bible studies, you know, we, we, we want them to practice. We want to guide them in that. We want them to have experience, but we want them to have the right experience. And then uh, the phrase, we learn by doing. That's true. But we also learn bad things by doing the wrong things. Better is that we learn by doing the right things. And this is where we as teachers want to involve the students, but make sure that they're well guided in their practice, they're properly evaluated in their experience, and that when they're learning by doing, they're doing the right things. And so that's incumbent upon us as teachers to make sure we're guiding them in the right way. There was a Chinese proverb that said, um, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. And that kind of follows the, the, what the psychologists say is that, you know, when it comes to 10% of what we hear, we, that's about what we retain. We retain about 10% of what we hear. We retain 50% of what we see. And so that's why it's important. If you can give a PowerPoint, if you have flannel graph, 
if you have coloring books, if you have worksheets, right? That's a visual for your kids. Uh, if, you, if you have a video that people can watch so that they can go through the material over and over again, um, you know, those, those are all types of uh, ways to help people hear and see. And then to do, 90% is retained when people are doing. And so an activity needs to be uh, meaningful. Um, an activity should not be busy work. Busy work that just occupies and because you got a whole hour to fill and you don't know how to fill it and, you, you know, and you just want to keep them busy, you know, I mean, and anything past three years of age, I suppose, you know, because I guess, you know, when you have a whole hour with three year olds, maybe there is a point where, you know, hey, coloring is a great thing, you know, but, but, you know, when they when they get older, uh, just coloring for busy work you know, without engaging them deeply, that's, that's something that we, uh, we want to rethink. So, so we need to have activities with determined outcomes. Uh, what is it we, we are trying to get the student to see and do? Take a look at Mark 8. Jesus had brought the disciples through the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, Verse 14 says they forgotten to bring bread and they only had one loaf and they go, what are we going to do? We got no bread. Uh, and and, uh, and in verse 16, and Jesus said, why are you discussing the fact that we don't have bread? You know, I know there's going to be a wheat shortage because of Ukraine being the breadbasket of Europe, you know, but do you not perceive or understand or are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, uh, 12. All right, so we started with five loaves. We've had 5,000 plus people, probably 15,000. And, uh, and because it, it was 5,000 men that were counted. And then we had enough leftovers to fill 12 baskets. And then uh, how about when we fed the 4,000? Seven of them, right? Seven loaves. How many baskets? And they said seven. And then he said to them, do you not yet understand? You know, are you not yet entertained? Or do you not yet understand? And so, so here is that... Um, Here's that problem that they are having here that uh, they're going to forget, you know, they're, you know, they, they forgot, even though they were not only just seeing it, they were not, not only hearing it, but they were doing it right. They were passing out all the food. They were, they were the ones involved and then they forgot still, but this is part of that repetition. We need to do it over. He's involving the disciples over and over again. So, as we reflect, you know, th think of maybe a class that you're teaching or a class that you have taught. You know, we've had, we haven't taught classes in, in person for a while, but some of you've been doing it online. But when we think about, think about the students, who's involved and why are they involved? Who's not involved and why are they not involved? And so as we think about these students, you know, I mean, there's, there's some that are real eager beavers and, you know, they're there because they want to, to please you or, or they're really connected to you. There's some that just do not want to be there. How do we connect with them? What activities can we use to employ them in effective learning? Fourth is the law of communication. The law of communication is bridge building. Right, we're watching situations in the Ukraine where they're trying to destroy bridges so the Russians can't come in, right? But we use bridges for connections to connect the East Bay to the West Bay, to connect the teacher to the student, to connect a teacher who's 30 years old to a kid who's 10, uh, 
uh, one who knows a lot versus one who is just starting to learn. One who has been saved for a while and, and has had a relationship with Christ to a kid that may not have that concept yet. So what we're trying to do is to build that bridge. Um, Gregory talks about uh, um, using words understood in the same way by the pupil and yourself. Uh, language clear and vivid to both. You know, so what we want to what we want to accomplish is, you know, the, that that word communication in and of itself comes from the Latin word where we get our word common. Right. So we talked about communion and community last Sunday. And, uh, you know, and here I'm making up words so people have no connection with the words that I'm making up. But so I'm violating the law of communication. But it's, uh, but it's all in jest. But here, the law of communication is, is finding the commonness that we have, and we need to bridge that gap. So some of the way to build these bridges are through the three avenues of the mind, will, and emotions. And so these are some of the bridges that we can build with our, our students. Um, to connect with them intellectually, to connect with them with the facts, why the fact of having a savior is so important for a 30-year-old and why it's important for a 10-year-old. And maybe you got saved at 10 and you can go back and make that connection. When I was your age, that's when I trusted Jesus as my savior. Right? So, so, uh, so through the mind, we connect with something we know. Through the emotion, something we feel through the will, something that we do. And so the key to the key to that is what excites you about the topic that you're teaching? And how can you get your student to be excited about that as well? What knowledge do we share and care about? You know, sometimes when I, when I see, uh, the kids, I try to learn what the, the interest is, right? Like, uh, you know, little Aaron Lee, he loves New Orleans football, right? He, he loves LSU, Louisiana State University, and he loves the New Orleans Saints. So when I see him, I just, I ask him about football, right? And, and so, so here are, are people you just try to connect with, you know, you, other people, you know, they like succulents or they like, uh, you know, they like to read or, or they like Marvel movies, right? So, so these are just some, some ways that, you know, there's things that excite you, then you find what excite other people. And then you just try to, to build that bridge to connect there. Uh, what knowledge do we share and care about? What experiences can we bridge? And so, um, so this is, uh, this is pretty important as, um, uh, as Howard Hendricks says, every time you teach, ask yourself, what do I know? And what do I want these students to know? Oh, I should go back to this. What do I feel? And what do I want them to feel? And what do I do? And what do I want them to do? So that, that's very, very key in teaching. What do I know? What I want them to know? What do I feel? What I want them to feel? What do I do? What do I want them to do? You know, when you think of, of Jesus asking us to be his witness, uh, that uh, he's telling us to do that by making disciples, teaching them to observe Matthew 28, right? And so, so here we're saying, hey, this is what I want them to know. This is what I want them to feel. This is what I want them to do. And, uh, and so it comes across there. So here's uh, Howard Hendricks' uh, suggestion on how uh, in this uh, law of communication. Uh, first, what we want to do is we want to perfect our communication. We want to get better at it. Um, we want our next lesson to be better than our last lesson. And we do that by preparation. Part of it is, is preparation. We are giving form and structure. We are packaging and making the package better, right? Um, I am... Uh, I am not a very good gift wrapper, you know, I'm not bad, 
I'm not like my wife. You know, my, my wife wraps gifts beautifully uh, and, uh, you know, pays attention to symmetry. You, you know, I will tuck the ends in stuff like that. But the idea is packaging is important. Mark, you know, and I don't want to just use the term marketing, but presenting a beautiful package means something when it's a lesson. Um, it, it needs to be tidy. It needs to be purposeful. And so not just uh, pre preparation, but presentation, which involves enunciation, speaking clearly so that people can understand exactly what you're saying, you know, which is uh, why we take the face masks off when we're teaching. It's just because it just keeps, keeps us just from enunciating when we're the main speaker. You know, um, so we want to perfect communication. Number two, eliminate distractions. There's two types of distractions. One is distractions that you can't control, right? Like a, a kid stressed out or a student didn't sleep well the night before. And so they're, they're dozing in and out or, or they're daydream believers. Um, yeah. Then there's distractions you can control like the room temperature, making sure it's just, just the right environment. It's not, it's not too hot where they're going to fall asleep. It's not too cold where they're too distracted, but it's Goldilocks temperature, right? It's just right. Or, or not having your slides in order. So, so you're, oh, oh, wait, oh, uh, no, no, I meant it this way. Uh, oh, no, wait, oh, where was that slide? Uh, you know, or, you know, when we have the song lyrics in, in wrong order, which is something I'm trying to learn how to make sure we sync up when we're singing, you know, and, and so, so those can be distractions that we can control. And then, uh, so perfect communication, eliminate distractions, and then get feedback. You know, the, the number one question we can ask is, do you understand? Do you have questions? And how does this apply? Right, so, so this is the how of the communication. So as we reflect, what kind of communication bridges should be built by the teacher with individuals in the class? Uh, how would you assess the qualities of your speaking style when you teach? Uh, and what is the best way to communicate a goal or a vision that you're passionate about? You know, maybe, you know, a book you're reading and then you're excited and tell them why, or a hobby that you have, bring it in a show and tell or something like that. Then we have number five, law, the law of the heart. And I'll, I'll kind of get through these last three a little bit more quickly. The law of the heart. Teaching that impacts is not head to head, but heart to heart. I don't know if you remember that. There was a show called Heart to Heart. And Max would go, hey, Mr. Hart. Hey, Mrs. Hart. Anyway, that was... Um, See, I, I made no bridge <laughs> to some of you there with that old TV show. But the uh, Socrates, Socrates said that the essence of learning involves ethos, which is character, pathos, which is compassion, and logos, those are the same word we, we use in John 1, right, to describe Christ, uh, or books, right, or the word uh, is logos, is content, so character, compassion, and content. Character establishes our credibility, our credentials. Why should this kid or why should this teenager and, and CTF listen to you, right? And so, so we need to have that sense of ethos for our credibility. Secondly, pathos, where we arouse passion and we massage emotions. Hendrick says, that's the secret to motivation because God created us as emotional feeling beings. So we connect to the heart or, uh, or compassion. So character gives credibility, compassion arouses emotions, and logos gives the facts, proofs, reason, brings understanding demonstrates the authority of God's revelation. And so, uh, so, so these are some of the ways to reach the heart, so the character, compassion, and content. We already talked about Romans 8.39, where it says we are conformed to the image of Christ. 
Romans 12, 12 says, do not be conformed to the world, but renew our mind, right? Because the simplest goal in learning is change. And that's the main thing that we want to accomplish. So where does learning begin? Where does learning begin? Hendrix says all learning begins at the feeling level. People accept what they feel disposed to accept and they reject what they feel disposed to reject. And so, you know, we wish they would have approached it intellectually first, but if a person is not emotionally invested in the class, that they're, they're, good, they're not gonna listen, All right? So it begins at that feeling level. Facts are important. We're not moving away from that because God has spoken in his revelation, but we, we need to be a person of impact. And we need to do that by, again, I'm repeating myself here, but we need to know our students. We need to earn the right to be heard. And we need to be willing to be vulnerable before our students. And so um, let me ask you the second question here. If you have a class going on right now, which students do you appreciate most and why? Which students do you think have the greatest need to sense your appreciation? So there are students that will appreciate you. There's some who don't. <laughs> and what is their great need where they can sense your appreciation to them? Um, and so, so that's just one way to think about how to connect to the law of the heart. Two more. The law of encouragement. This law is teaching tends to be most effective when the learning is properly motivated. So this has to do with motivation. Now, when we, we talk about motivation, we're to hear the Shema, which is in Deuteronomy chapter six. This was something that was recited regularly uh, by the Old Testament Jews, uh, where they would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You can see the heart is, uh, is what he's aiming at. The, the heart aims for the emotions, the will, and the mind. It's the intellect the emotions, and the will or volition, right? And so the, the heart encompasses all of that. He's going for the heart. It's what motivates us. Howard Hendricks said that the, uh, a person's MQ, which is his motivation quotient, is more important than his IQ, which is his intellectual quotient, right? We talk about EQ, a person's emotional quotient, or his intellectual quotient is IQ, MQ, the motivational quotient, is really the most important factor we're looking for as teachers. What is the key to properly motivate? You know, I mean, think about it. Is candy the best motivator for good behavior? <laughs> I don't know, I'm not saying it's bad. You know, I mean, I'll do anything for... Uh, for a rhesus, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I mean, I, I'm practically a rhesus monkey. Um, uh, but but think about it: is is a pizza party the best motivation for memorizing scripture, or is guilt a good motivator for memorizing scripture? Right, because guilt can be a bad motivation too. So. When it comes to motivation, when it comes to encouragement, um, it's, it's important that we motivate properly. So what we want to do is involve good training, right? So good training, like, um, you know, people are motivated to lose weight. People are motivated to bring down their blood sugar. Uh, people are motivated to just stay healthy and keep their cardio up. People are motivated to have you know, well-defined muscles that they can, uh, you know, post on Instagram or, you know, and so, the, so people train for different motivations. Well, 
It's important for us to motivate with good training. It involves four major stages. Number one, the telling stage. So we need to put lesson in a clear form that they can review repeatedly. That's why we'll do notes, visual slideshow, audio video recording, YouTube videos. Maybe you'll have a three by five card guide. Maybe uh, you use flannel graphs. You know, those things might come back like record players came back, you know? And so, you know, things like that. Then there's the telling stage where we, 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 we put it in people's hands so that they can digest it. Sometimes it's more than just this. They need to go back and, and go over the notes again. Secondly, the showing stage where you provide a model. What does it look like? So we tell it and then we model it. Okay. So we, we show how it's done. I love, I love, uh, I love cooking demonstrations, right? I, I like those real quick clips on Instagram. I, I like to follow this chef Shoda, you know, from Seattle. He's a Japanese chef. I, I don't know, Daniel, if you know him, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, he's got some of the really coolest things to cook in about 15 seconds. Well, at least he shows us in 15 seconds, you know, and then uh, Lee Kum Ki, you know, Lee Kum Ki has, uh, they have an Instagram page where they also have recipes, right? So I've been watching that to try to work on my, uh, on my beef chow fun. Uh, and, um, and I've, I've made it about three or four times and, eh, you know, I'm not at restaurant quality yet, but the showing stage I'm watching, right? And it's providing a model of what it looks like. So we tell, we show, then we bring them into doing in a controlled situation. So we might have them do in a class, right? You might have them make the tabernacle or you might have, uh, you know, when it's a class project or you might you might have them share the gospel with each other and they're role playing, but then you take them to the street in an uncontrolled situation, right? And then you say, all right, go out and share the gospel with somebody. I know our girls had that class at Biola where they had a, like, they went on a bus and they went to a, another part of town and they had to share the gospel. They had to be a witness. And so they're doing that in an uncontrolled real life situation. So, so this is the motivation through good training. We tell well, we show, we model well, then we help them to do it in a controlled situation and then an uncontrolled situation. And so, uh, so, so it's important that, um, that, that we motivate in, in a good way. Howard Hendricks was asked, uh, how do you get a person motivated? And he said, when you sock someone with 20,000 volts of electricity, they don't turn to you and ask, did you say something? No, they move. And so that's what we want to do. We want to shock them to a point where they're not just saying, oh, wait, what was that? No, they moved. And that's, that's the motivation that we want to give them. Um, what results from your teaching do you honestly expect in the lives of your students? Um, how can we how can we motivate what what signals do you look for when your students are bored you know like well they turn off their screen and they're playing video games in the background <laughs> it's not just you're not doing that um and then uh, and then the last law is the law of readiness this is where the teaching learning process will be most effective when both student and teacher are adequately prepared in other words, just be ready, be ready. Um, how, you know, uh, how do we prepare? How are we ready? And it, we, we kind of covered this in our past lessons, but uh, we want to give assignments. Assignments, uh, if, if you just go and you, you walk into the class and all right, everybody turn into uh, Isaiah 57 and tell me what it's about, all right? That's... Um, you already lost your class. What we can do is we can give them some kind of assignment, maybe some discussion, maybe ask them some questions, but we want to do a mental warm up. It provides backgrounds, a foundation in which to build. We call it the hook, perhaps. Uh, they develop habits of independent study when they have an assignment. Um, good assignments are creative. It's not busy work. We're not just keeping them busy because you know, 
let's just keep them quiet so I can go on my phone and play Wordle. Uh, we want it to be thought provoking and, and doable. And we want to give them experiences. We want to fight silence. We want to, uh, feed, I mean, we don't want chaos noise, but we, we don't want just dead. We, we want to feel tough questions, control discussion dominators. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in our, our, when we talk about how to lead a good discussion. What do you do if you have somebody who just dominates, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that. And then we want to help uh, students develop as note takers. So, so these are some of the, the, the things that we want to do, that we want to be ready for, that we help ready them for the lessons. And so um, um, what steps do you usually take in preparing for each class you teach? What's the most helpful? Are you too predictable in your teaching? List a half a dozen learning activities that you can appropriate for your class and try them next time. Um, when you sat under another person's teaching and you wanted to take notes on what he or she said, what exactly motivated you to feel that way? Right? And so, uh, so these are just some things to think about as we uh, think about the readiness of our preparation. And so that's, uh, so those are the seven laws of teaching and, um, and, and I hope you found it helpful. And, and again, I just give, I give all credit to Howard Hendricks and, uh, and Gregory for all, all of this material. I just uh, shamelessly duplicated their, their material, but I give them credit because they, they thought through it well. But it's, uh, it's, I think it's important for us as teachers to think about that, to challenge ourselves as teachers. Any questions, comments, additions to these laws? Because there's probably like 12 laws of teaching too. Anything? All right, I'm going to stop the recording here.